I see the better years that hasten by carry thee back into that shadowy past where in the dusty spaces void and vast the graves of those whom thou hast murdered lie the slave pen though whose door thy victims pass no more is there and there shall the grim block remain at which the slave was sold while at thy feet scourges and engines of restraint and pain molder and rust by thine eternal seat there mid the symbols that proclaim thy crimes dwell thou a warning to the coming times welcome to history uncensored the best place to dig into the history nobody wanted to tell you this is a reminder this is an uncensored show i will probably share some things that will upset you my opinions on things will probably upset you i will swear sometimes i don't apologize history shouldn't be censored we shouldn't be taught just the rosy parts and when we dig into it rome is a great example of how a civilization built upon the backs of slaves and farmers is remembered as one of the greatest in history. But when we think about the Roman Empire, we don't think about the negative sides of it. We don't think about the slaves, unless you're thinking about gladiators. We don't think necessarily about how the negative sides of Rome impacted modern society or the entirety of Western civilization. But it did. I bet if you ask anyone what civilization had the greatest impact on the Western world, I'm pretty certain that they would unequivocally say that it is the Roman Empire. It's just the way it is. I'm going to give you the briefest chronological overview of the Roman Empire I possibly could. And then I'm going to talk about some other things like what Rome gave us, why it's important to study them. I'll talk about slaves, and I'll talk about the upcoming episodes in the Roman part of the history of slavery, which, to be honest, is just a really big fucking part. All right, here we go. Chronological overview of Rome coming at you. The history of the Roman Empire can be divided into three distinct periods. The period of kings, 625 to 510 BC, the Republican Rome, 510 to 31 BC, and Imperial Rome, 31 BC, and 476 CE. Rome was founded right around 625 in areas of ancient Italy known as Etruria and Latium. It is thought that the city-state of Rome was initially formed by Latium villagers joining together with settlers from the surrounding hills in response to an Etruscan invasion. Also, Romulus and Remus, two of the best names in history. The Period of Kings 625-510 to 510 BCE The first period in Roman history is known as the Period of Kings, and it lasted from Rome's founding until 510. During this brief time, Rome, led by no fewer than six kings, advanced both militaristically and economically, with increases in physical boundaries, military might, and production, as well as trade of goods including oil lamps. Politically, this period saw the early formation of the Roman Constitution. The end of the period of kings came with the decline of Etruscan power, thus ushering in Rome's Republican period. Republican Rome 510 to 31 BCE. No longer ruled by kings, the Romans established a new form of government whereby the upper classes ruled, namely the senators and the equestrians, or knights. However, a dictator could be nominated in times of crisis. In 451, the Romans established the Twelve Tables, a standardized code of laws meant for public, private, and political matters. Rome continued to expand through the Republican period and gained control over the entire Italian peninsula by 338. It was the Punic Wars from 264 to 146, along with some conflicts with Greece that allowed Rome to take control of Carthage and Corinth, 
and thus become the dominant maritime power in the Mediterranean. Soon after, Rome's political atmosphere pushed the Republic into a period of chaos and civil war. This led to the election of a dictator, El Cornelius Sulla, who served from 82 to 80 BCE. Following Sulla's resignation in 79 BCE, the Republic returned to a state of unrest, while Rome continued to be governed as a Republic for another 50 years. The shift to imperialism began to materialize in 60, when Julius Caesar rose to power. By 51, Julius Caesar had conquered Celtic Gaul, and for the first time Rome's borders had spread beyond the Mediterranean region. Although the Senate was still Rome's governing body, its power was weakening. Julius Caesar was assassinated in 44 and replaced by his heir Gaius. Julius Caesar Octavianus, or otherwise known as Octavian, who ruled alongside Mark Antony. In 31 BCE, Rome overtook Egypt, which resulted in the death of Mark Antony and left Octavian as the unchallenged ruler of Rome. He assumed the title of Augustus and thus became the first emperor of Rome. Imperial Rome, 31 BCE to 476 CE. Rome's imperial period was its last, beginning with the rise of Rome's first emperor and lasting until the fall of Rome in 476. During this period, Rome saw several decades of peace, prosperity, and expansion. By 117 CE, the Roman Empire had reached its maximum extent, spanning three continents including Asia Minor, Northern Africa, and most of Europe. In CE 286, the Roman Empire was split into Eastern and Western Empires, each ruled by its own emperor. The Western Empire suffered several Gothic invasions and in 455 was sacked by the Vandals. Rome continued to decline until 476 when the Western Roman Empire came to an end. The Eastern Roman Empire, more commonly known as the Byzantine Empire, survived until the 15th century CE. Like I said, a very brief overview of Rome. And I'll get into why I, I did that in a little bit. But when we think of Rome and pun intended romanticizing when in Rome, when we think about the, the legacy and the history of Rome, we remember the stories of conquering Caesars, of innovative technology and spurious rulers. But let us take the time to get to know the people and the institutions that made Rome what we remember it as. Why should we do that? What did Rome bring to Western civilization? What were its lasting properties and lessons? Numerous. They were numerous. Art and architecture. Ancient Romans had a tremendous impact on art and architecture. We can find traces of Roman influence in form and structures throughout the development of Western culture. Although the Romans were heavily influenced by ancient Greece, they were able to make improvements to certain borrowed Greek designs and inventions. For example, the continued use of columns, but the form became more decorative and less structural, structural in Roman buildings. Ancient Romans created curved roofs and large-scale arches, which were able to support more weight than the post and beam construction the Greeks used. These arches served as the foundation for the massive bridges and aqueducts the Romans created. The game-loving agents also built large amphitheaters, including the Colosseum. The sports stadiums we see today with their oval shapes and tiered seating derive from the basic idea that the Romans developed. The arches of the Colosseum are made out of cement, a remarkably strong building material made of volcanic ash and rock. Modern scientists believe that the use of this ash is the reason that structures like the Colosseum, Colosseum still stand today, and why our modern concrete is shit. Roman underwater structures proved to be even sturdier. Seawater reacting with the volcanic ash created crystals that filled in the cracks in the concrete. To make concrete this durable, modern builders must reinforce it with steel. So today, scientists study Roman concrete hoping to match the success of the ancient master builders. The sculptural art of the period has proven to be fairly durable too. Romans made their statues out of marble, fashioning monuments of, to great human achievements and achievers rather than to gods and goddesses. The focus of in partic particularity 
contrast to the Greek sculptures, which focused on gods, goddesses, myths, and mythos, you can still see thousands of Roman artifacts today in museums all over the world. Technology and science. Ancient Romans pioneered advances in many areas of science and technology, establishing tools, methods that have ultimately shaped the way the world does certain things. They were really very good engineers. They understood the laws of physics well enough to develop aqueducts and better ways to aid water flow. They harnessed water as energy for powering mines and mills. They also built an expansive road network stretching over 74,000 miles, a ridiculous achievement at that time. Their roads were built by laying gravel, then paving with rock slabs. The Roman road system was so large, it was said that all roads lead to Rome. Along with the large-scale engineering projects, the Romans also developed tools and methods for use in agriculture, such as wheeled plows and oxen drip oxen-drawn harvesting machines. The Romans became successful farmers due to their knowledge of climate, soil, and other planting-related subjects. They developed ways to effectively plant crops and to irrigate and drain their fields. Their techniques are still used by modern farmers, such as crop rotation, pruning, grafting, seed selection, and manuring. The Romans also used mills to process their grains from farming, which improved their efficiency and employed many people. And as you can kind of guess as I'm going through this, these are just really brief overview because this isn't the whole reason we're here, but I still think it's important to just discuss some of the reasons why Roman culture was so influential. Literature and language. Much of the literature of the world has been greatly influenced by the literature of the ancient Romans, as well as the Greeks, during what is considered the golden age of Roman poetry. Poets like Virgil, Horace, and Ovid produced works that would have an everlasting impact. Ovid's Metamorphoses, for example, inspired authors such as Chaucer, Milton, Dante, and Shakespeare. Shakespeare in particular was fascinated by the ancient Romans, who served as the inspirations for some of his most enduring plays, Julius Caesar and Antony and Cleopatra. While Roman literature had a deep impact on the rest of the world, it is important to note the impact that Roman languages had on the Western world. Ancient Romans spoke Latin, which spread throughout the world with the increase of Roman political power. Latin became the basis for a group of languages referred to as the Romance languages. These include French, Spanish, Italian, Portuguese, Romanian, and Catalan. Many Latin root words are also the foundation for many English words. English alphabet is based on the Latin alphabet. Along with that, a lot of Latin is still used in the present day justice system. And it wasn't just the use of Latin words in law, which is the next subject here. The use of Latin words is not the only way the ancient Romans have influenced the Western justice system. Although the Roman justice system was extremely harsh in its punishments, it did serve as a rough outline of how court proceedings happen today. For example, there was a preliminary hearing, much like there is today, where the magistrate decided whether or not there was actually a case. If there were grounds for a case, a prominent Roman citizen would try the case, and witnesses and evidence would be presented. Roman laws and their court system have served as the foundation for many countries' justice systems, such as the United States and much of Europe. The ancient Romans laid a groundwork for many aspects of the modern world. It's no surprise that a once booming empire was able to impact the world in so many ways. Like fast food. I said it, fast food. We can blame the Romans for McDonald's. It might seem a modern marvel, but the Romans were the first to introduce street stalls and food on the move, as we might think of it today. With 10,000 soldiers in Britain based at forts such as Bertuswald, having access to tasty convenient food was vitally important and vendors serving fast food would have been commonplace in large towns. The Romans also introduced staple foods such as apples, pears, and peas to Britain. Advertising and trademarks. The modern concept of public relations, marketing, and advertising can all trace the roots back to the Romans. Traders would advertise their wares with billboards and signs. While self-promotion was a major concern to the emperor, and who proclaimed his military victories on his coins. Potters would often stamp their vessels with their name, a mark of quality. Currency. 
Although some of the tribes in the south of England produced coins before the Romans arrived, it was not used as currency to purchase things. The Romans brought in their own coinage, which was the same across the empire. A denarius minted in Rome could be spent in Britain, North Africa, or Turkey. Such a global currency has not been seen since. Those are all some of the very positive influences that were felt by the Western and more importantly, modern world. Rome was expansive and utilized very modern technology to accomplish their most successful feats. The one thing that was not really mentioned in this is how exactly did they have the manpower to accomplish all of the public works, a shared economy, while one class of people was firmly on the bottom. That's right, in the following episodes, we return to slavery and its sordid history with Rome. We're just going to take a short break and I'll be right back and we'll discuss slavery more in depth as well as future episodes. Welcome back from the break. Slavery was a primordial fact, contemporary with the origin of society. It had its roots in an age of the human species when all inequalities had their raison d'etre. But the Greeks and Romans independently, so far as we can see, transformed this primordial fact into something new and wholly original in world history. Namely, an institutionalized system of large-scale employment of slave labor in both the countryside and the cities. In Marxist language, the slave mode of production was the decisive invention of the Greco-Roman world. That invention is not easily explained. For when one man is the property of another, it implies com compulsory labor. The right of property in this case, the object of it being a man, is a, power, is a power over that man's will. The Romans recognized this. The master has not only a right of property over the slave as over a lifeless thing, also a power like that over his son. That is a power over the slave's will. The right of property that is a legally unlimited power over a man were useless if the owner did not influence the man's will, and this influencing is equivalent to imposing labor upon him, labor being taken in the widest sense imaginable, a mere physical possession, such as the preserving of captives for cannibal purposes. Possession of human beings as a social institution is that which gets hold of the will of its object. Hence, it follows that slavery is the fact that one man or woman is the property or possession of another. Their skins were seamed all over with the marks of old floggings, as you could easily see through the holes in the ragged shirts that shaded rather than covered their scarred backs. But some wore only loincloths. They had letters branded on their foreheads, and half-shaved heads and irons on their legs. Their complexions were frightfully yellow, their eyelids caked with the smoke of the baking ovens, their eyes so bleary and inflamed that they could hardly see out of them, and they were powdered like athletes in the arena, but with dirty flour, not dust. In general terms, one could say that the law, with all its complexity of detail, is simply the best source of information available for knowledge of topics such as the use of slaves as agents in Roman life. But the central problem this evidence raises is, of course, that of its representativeness. To what extent is the law an accurate index of the conditions and workings of Roman slavery? The problem comes into particular focus in the law's description of the sources of slavery and the manner in which the description can be explicated. Slaves are reduced to our ownership by civil law 
or by the law of nations, by the civil law, if a person more than 20 years old allows himself to be sold to share in the price. Those slaves are ours by the law of nations who are captured from the enemy or who are the offspring of our female slaves. 1.15 Marxian. I really do want to make a quick mention that the following episodes will probably be very graphic. They're probably going to upset your sensibilities because the subject is really fucking dark. I want to remind everybody listening about the truth of history. It's terrible. I mean, really fucking terrible. I do want to warn you that one episode in the series will be dedicated to child exposure. I'm going to warn you when that happens. But child exposure is simply put the culling of unwanted babies. And in Rome, it was usually female children. It's hard for me to talk about, but these are the parts of history that need to be remembered so we do not repeat our trans transgressions time and time again. I won't get into what impact child exposure had on Roman slavery right now, but I will. Who were these slaves? What did they do? Where did they come from? Roman slavery was institutionalized at a level beyond anything in history to that point. Now, in Athens, Greece, I would say that slavery was more populous uh, based on the level of population. But in Rome, it spread through three continents, Asia Minor, Europe, and Northern Africa. The lives of these slaves, their stories, and how they lived are going to be examples of what I will cover in the next few episodes. Because Rome was so influential, especially to some of the later episodes I'll cover on slavery, I think I'm going to cover it chronologically at first, and then cover some more of the interesting stories and subjects. Examples are going to be child exposure, gladiators, slaves in the sexual industry in Rome, romanticizing Roman slavery and the modern definition of it, rebellions, as well as the impact Roman slavery had on later iterations. I hope you guys are patient with me as I work out all of the details, but it appears that we will be in Rome for a while. I will make sure to figure in a great woman from Rome's history, as well as history's idiots. Fortunately for me, there are no shortage of choices there, and they should tie in nicely into the Roman theme over the next two months or so. If you guys have any suggestions on other topics that you would like me to cover, please reach out. As a reminder, both my email as well as my Twitter profile. A link will be in the description for the episode. If you would like to be a guest on the show and have knowledge of a certain area of history, please reach out to me as well. I'm always looking to diversify the episodes. I'm sure we can take a day to get in some very unique history as well as your perspective on things. Other than that, you people are fucking amazing. Rome is going to be awesome, and I am positive that it will be eye-opening for everyone, including some who might think they're experts on Roman history. History isn't always about the man on top. It's about the people that put their blood, sweat, tears, and lives on the line to make it great. In essence, slaves. They've been around since the beginning of civilization and possibly even before, so join me in History Uncensored as I guide you down Rome's turbulent history and the wake of destruction it left on the lives of more than several million slaves. Don't forget to subscribe if you're new here and leave a review and comment if at all possible. I literally can't tell you how much those ratings, those reviews, and those subscriptions mean to me as a lone podcast producer. If you want to get really spicy, share these episodes on your social media timeline. But for now, this has been Seth Michaels with History Uncensored. And remember, history never forgets. We knew the world would not be the same. Few people laughed. Few people cried. Most people were silent. I remembered the line from the Hindu scripture, the Bhagavad Gita says, now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. I suppose we 